This is Rick Rule for Rule Investment Media, sponsors and producers of the Natural Resources Investment Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. This is another in our series of CEO interviews meant to prepare our attendees, uh, getting, getting them to know the exhibitors so that they can spend their time in Boca Raton more efficiently. I'm delighted today to interview Mr. Darwin Green, CEO uh, of uh, High Gold, a man who I've known, I suspect now for the better part of two decades. Uh, disclosure, I'm a high gold shareholder. Uh, we believe it's important that we own every exhibitor at the conference. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee that because I own a stock, it goes up, but it does guarantee that we have vetted every exhibitor, that we have spent our time and treasure on them. High gold being no exception, and I'm delighted to be a high gold shareholder. Darwin, thank you for subjecting yourself to this interview. Thank you too for your ongoing <laughs> sponsorship of our investment symposiums. Well, thank you, Rick. It's always a pleasure to, to connect and talk about our story. Let's talk about the history of High Gold, how it came about, what it was set up to do, who the people were. Uh, give us a bit of a backdrop before we go into what you've done lately. Yeah, sure. I mean, we were really built around a project that came to us in Alaska. It came to us from an Alaska Native Corporation. It's a high grade gold, copper, zinc project that had sat idle for about 30 years. It came into another company and we, we actually did a spin out to create high gold out of that company and uh, brought some of the best people and talent and some of the best assets in. And uh, we spent the last four years steadily advancing that project and we've had great success over those, those past four years. Uh, I think it's fair to say though, that you have been in Alaska for a very long time, you and your team, that you have local expertise, which is what caused you to be the chosen partner for the Alaska Native Corporation. Could you describe a bit of that? Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, no, I do have a long history there and, um, you know, over 20 years now uh, working on various projects involved with discoveries uh, throughout Southeast Alaska. Um, VMS Copper Zinc Discoveries brought in a Japanese smelting partner on one project. And uh, yeah, we know how to operate up there. And, and I think as, uh, you know, you're going to run a company you want to focus on jurisdictions you know well and deposit types you know well which we do we also have a very deep technical bench and something we pride ourselves in you know there's a lot of junior mining companies uh you know they're they're about as deep as their their uh, their web page and there's not much more behind that and, and we really pride ourselves on that on that technical depth and uh and, and culturing talent over, over over time so that it gives us i think a much better chance for success and uh we're, i think we've been proving that with what we've been doing i'm delighted to say that the industry shares your view of the technical depth in your company i hear time and time again from peers uh, and other sophisticated investors uh, about the comfort that they feel with regards to the technical capabilities of your team, particularly technical capabilities, as you suggest, in the terrain that they're exploring, in the deposit types that they're exploring for, uh, which is something that uh, has, of course, given me some comfort. Let's talk now about the focus asset, uh, what it is, a little more about how you got it, uh, what you think it is, what the results are that you've uh, obtained to date. Give us an overview uh, of this asset. Yeah, I guess first and foremost, it's a very high grade deposit that we have right now. We have established a resource in the indicated category of a little more than a million ounces gold equivalent at just under 10 grams uh, gold equivalent. So very high grade and gold makes up about 60% of that value. The rest is copper and zinc, good metallurgy, no major uh, red flags on this project. But really, you know, that's a lot of gold and it's very high grade, uh, but really what separates it from the pack is its thickness. We've got an average true thickness of about 40 meters. Uh, that makes it very mineable you know, from a mining cost perspective. Um, generally, the thicker and more compact your, your deposit, that way the, the, the lower your costs are to extract things. Um, but we equally like the, the exploration upside. So there's, uh, we made a new discovery about four kilometers away from our main deposit. We have several other prospects that we're testing. So we've been able to demonstrate what we've got is very, very attractive. And we think there's a lot more of that to come. And, uh, and that's really been our focus in terms of how we got the property. Uh, we were approached by an Alaska Native Corporation. Alaska's quite unique in terms of how it settled its land claims. It did it about 50 years ago. Very progressive and very attractive model. They basically, uh, they created 12 regional corporate entities that were able to select lands. Um, 
for their natural resource potential. And if anything happens when they're in control of their own natural resources, they do a pretty good job of managing them and, uh, and wanting to, to see them be developed. And uh, from a political support, uh, social license aspect, it feels really good as the CEO to have that relationship and have that knowledge on the front end that they're going to be direct beneficiaries of, uh, of the development. Um, so we have a lease with them. It's a long-term lease. We're growing the asset. We're, we're, you know, we've got a new discovery that we're expanding. Uh, we're expanding our main deposit, but we're also at that point where we're, we're trying to de-risk the project. So while we're drilling, look ahead into the future and look about the things, look for the things that you want to have in place uh, to, you to, so that you're not held up and stalled at any point in time. And so we're working on a lot of those items right now as well. Uh, so hopefully two worlds come together and we can be talking about developing a project in a couple of years. Darwin, when people think about Alaska, they think about uh, Santa Claus's side yard, the, the wilderness. Uh, talk about access and digress to this project. I think that's one of its selling points. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Actually, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's critical. I think it has to be one of the first lenses you look at for projects, um, particularly in the northern terrains of, of North America. There's incredible mineral endowment, but uh, you know, a deposit remains a deposit and not a mine unless you can get it out of the ground. And uh, there's some world-class deposits and not world-class mines for exactly that reason. That is not our issue. We're right adjacent to the coast. We're about a 30 minute flight from Cook In or from Anchorage, right down Cook Inlet. Um, and so that tidewater access is critical. Um, we're, you'd have to build about 15 miles of road, uh, but the project comes with an easement right written into law actually through federal act of Congress, that was part of the native corpse, uh, Alaska native corpse rights. Um, and that's huge. Uh, you know, you're always exporting, we've got communities and workforces close at hand, but you're not right in a community. Um, and you've got that access, tidewater access, and there will be concentrates if this is shipped, um, overseas, um, or you're, you develop a mine here, you would be producing concentrates ultimately. So almost all of those smelters, are on the other side of the Pacific. So again, really advantageous to be, be off the coast. Let's talk about that concentrate. Sometimes when people see gold, copper, and zinc, uh, they're nervous about recoveries. Can you talk something about the metallurgy, the grade that you talk about in the gold? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question again. Yeah, and it, yeah it's, it's uh, you know, in some ways, uh, having a multiple or a polymetallic deposit, multiple metals in one deposit is an attractive thing in that it provides you a natural hedge. You know, gold could be up and copper could be down or vice versa. But it's not always a perfect world if the metallurgy is poor. In our case, that was something we wanted to answer very early. And we did uh, detailed studies to, 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 to demonstrate that it has very good recoveries. We have gold recoveries in, in the high 90s. We have copper recovery in the mid to high 80s and zinc recovery in the in the in the low 90s with no nasties it's straightforward kind of process so we really like that um you know one thing that this project offers rick that's a little unique and it's something we're evaluating is because we are on tidewater and marine transports your lowest cost form of transportation by far we've got a bit of a unique opportunity or optionality for this project for development which is putting the ore onto a barge and sending it to somebody else's mine for processing. And it's something we're looking at as a, as a potential option that's attractive from a standpoint of lower execution risk, lower capex, and still attractive returns. You've got to weigh the extra cost of getting it somewhere else against the capital of building a project. But when you think it's probably 25 bucks a ton to put it on a barge and send it anywhere, in, in, in Alaska or Northwest BC, it's, it's pretty attractive. And I know those numbers quite well because there's a project in Alaska that's shipping limestone down to uh, the Columbia River at that price. So it's, uh, Darwin, yeah, you talk about nice uh, effectively, you talk about effectively a million ounces of gold equivalent at present uh, at, a, at a median sort of grade of uh, 10 grams a ton, which is attractive. You talk about two things, uh, exploration making it bigger and, and then de-risking it. Could you talk about both of those efforts uh, in sequence so that people can understand what it is that you'll do for them this field season? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we feel it remains very early days in the exploration cycle of this project. We, we keep finding more and we keep stepping out more. Um, so we will this summer, uh, you know, we're going to have an 8,000 meter program, um, drill program, we will be dedicated on the Ellis zone. That's that new discovery we made. 
be stepping out on that with the objective of establishing our first resource for that deposit, which is a second deposit um, to our main deposit. We also have some very attractive targets right on trend from the main deposit that are actually closer to, to the main deposit that we've yet to test that we really like, as well as expanding the main deposit. So it's going to be very, very active summer for us drilling and growing the system. And that's, you know, that's probably the best way to create value in this industry is with the drill bit. If you're having success uh, and accelerating it, and that will continue to de-risk it. We think we likely have a mine already. It just becomes more compelling the more we find. Uh, concurrent with all that, the de-risking we think is equally important. It's less sexy from a market standpoint right now, but fundamentally, if folks are looking for an exit strategy or an ultimate bigger win for the project, um, you got to shorten that timeline to potential production. And so you got to anticipate well in advance of when you might need things. So right now, this year, we're building, we're permitting an airstrip and expanded it road or a road to where a future portal would go. And we're evaluating uh, all the data we would need to support permitting of an underground ramp to access the project. And that underground ramp would be for exploration to keep growing the deposit, uh, but also take it to feasibility to upgrade the deepest, richest part of the deposit where we have 50, 60 meters running better than 15 grams, uh, upgrade that to measure to support feasibility. So those are the elements we're working on this year, very aggressively. You uh, have historically had a range of assets in high gold, and I note a very recent transaction where it would appear that you'd like to isolate assets uh, and spin them out where I'm, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, where you didn't feel you were receiving value so that you can concentrate on the high gold uh, assets. Could you talk about that transaction uh, and, and describe this, the spin out as well? Yeah, absolutely. It's a we are spinning out our Canadian gold assets where you're absolutely right. We feel we weren't getting full value for them inside high gold. We are pretty much only being valued for our Johnson tract in Alaska. We're spinning out those out into a new vehicle called Onyx Gold. So if you're a shareholder of high gold, you will receive shares of Onyx Gold and we're financing, we're raising more than 7 million in that company as it goes live. So it will fund its own way. What that does is it attracts it. It does several things. One, it unlocks value first and foremost. We think it's a nice creative way to create value for existing shareholders. Two, it allows high gold to not be distracted. All our money, all our management focus can focus on turning high gold and Johnson Tract into a success. Three, it helps, uh, I guess, put investors with the right type of projects more easily. Some guys like the security of a, of a real deposit that's kind of got visibility on a venture eventual production. Other guys just like that pure, raw, early discovery stage uh, type uh, exposure, which the spin out does. And, you know, we've done a good job this last uh, three months. We raised 9 million for high gold and we raised, uh, we're raising 7 million for this new spin out. It should be listed and trading by the end of June, early July. Finally, Darwin, we always encourage our attendees uh, to be well prepared when they come to our conference. You only have four days and 48 hours to get everything we have to offer at the conference. It's important for people to understand what the opportunities are before the conference. Uh, it's important too to make contact with the company so that after the conference, you can get the unanswered questions answered. How do people learn more about High Gold? First of all, your website and who in particular and what is the contact for a living, breathing human being that will curate the high gold experience for my attendees. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, myself, I'm always available. People can can call me if they like. Um, and Naomi Nemeth, we have a VP of investor relations. She's often more accessible than I am, but we're both very happy to receive uh, receive calls. And the numbers for that, I, I'm terrible. I don't have it at the top of my head here. It's on, it's on our website, but I would recommend going to highgoldmining.com and then look for the investor page and track us down. Lots of content on the, uh, on the website and, uh, and videos like this that provide information, but yeah, absolutely. We love, uh, answering questions. It's one of the great democratizations of the investment world. You know, you can have zoom meetings with, uh, with individual investors and there's a lot better access than there used to be 10 years ago. I'll tell you for, for talking to CEOs and, and getting questions answered. Well, you answered that question correctly. I love it when the CEO says, start with me. Uh, that's the best place, uh, I think, 
uh, possible. As you suggest, if you're uh, up in Alaska and unavailable, there are, of course, people uh, in the company who can help. But the fact that they have access to the CEO tells me that the CEO cares something about their cost of capital and their shareholders. Darwin, uh, thank you for your efforts on behalf of junior resource investors for, I'm thinking, almost three decades. And thank you, too, for your ongoing commitment and support to the Natural Resources Investment Symposium. We look forward to uh, getting you warmed up uh, down in Boca Raton, Florida, and getting you ready for colder climates in Alaska. Right on. Well, it, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to answer some of your questions and talk to uh, the folks that listen to you, Rick. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. So thank you again for, for, the, for the interview. Thank you.